This uh, past early September, I did something that I rarely do. Uh, I went back to preside over a funeral of a former church member at a place that I'd previously served. We pastors try to let the current pastors do the pastoring. But two young ladies who had been a part of our youth group asked me to come back to help bury their father. The oldest is a sophomore in college. The youngest is a senior in high school. Their half-brother on their dad's side had committed suicide while I served as their pastor. So I had, I had walked through some hard things with their family. Their dad got COVID-19 and died. And the reason that they were planning their dad's funeral was that their mom also had COVID-19. And she was sedated, unconscious, on a ventilator, completely unaware that her husband had died and that her daughters were planning his funeral. And about three weeks after that funeral, their mom died. Why? The bad things happen to good people. You've asked that question. Why? Why is there so much suffering? Why? If, <laughs> if God is good like we just sang about, then why? Why Hugo? Why Katrina? Why Ida? Why tornadoes and earthquakes and volcanoes? Why COVID-19 and cancer? Why hurt and heartache and betrayal and financial ruin? Why evil and war and hate? How can this God who says he loves us let us go through such Misery. I'd bet you've been through your fair share of suffering and you've asked God that big question why? Why do we have to go through this? Does God make us go through these things as some kind of cruel test? And and why won't he intervene if he's all powerful and sovereign and make it stop or just fix it? And why is there even evil in the first place? And come on, the question that we're all kind of asking when we say, why do bad things happen to good people is, why do bad things happen to me? Right? Why, why do bad things happen to me? I feel like I'm a pretty good person, God. I feel like I'm trying. I mean, look at him. Look at her. Look at that, that person I work with, and they're so mean and hateful and they seem to get good things and I try to be nice to everybody and I get bad things. So I want to tackle as much as I can of this question in in, in one message. There, um, there's a lot of layers to it. There's some mystery in it, but also believe there's some hope in it. And this question was, was certainly prominent when we, a couple of months ago, asked uh, you to ask the questions, asking for a friend, kind of the questions you've got about God, church, the Bible, faith, um, that uh, you've always wanted to ask. And over and over again, we saw that why do bad things happen to good people? And I want to tackle it in what I think is kind of the chronological order of uh, of the answer that we can come closest to finding in Scripture of just kind of three big chunks of the answer. And, and the three big chunks are this, is help, uh, trying to understand who God is, like who is he? Is, okay, this, if this God is good, what does that mean? How does he relate to us? What God allows, which is kind of that why, like why would, why does this happen? Because God allows it. What does exactly God allow? And how God responded to 
what has happened, how God responds to this suffering, how God responds to this. So let's first talk about who God is. Now last week I talked about free will and predestination and God's foreknowledge and trying to understand that. I I, I highly encourage you to watch that uh, message uh, just because the reason I kicked off this series with that with that topic is because I believe that topic is baked into many of the questions that we ask, but is particularly important uh, in this one because we're trying to understand who God is and how, how this all works. Because, for instance, this is the question when we're asking why God th- bad things happen to good people and when we're thinking about God's knowledge and all-powerful God, this is really what we're kind of digging at, right? If God knew it would go wrong, like why did he create it in the first place? Because where we need to start to answer this question is creation. And the question that we all want to know, like, okay, if God knew there was going to be so much hurt and heartache, if God knew there was going to be so much pain, if God knew that there was going to be so much betrayal, like, why did he even create it in the first place? Doesn't God know everything? And didn't he know we were going to sin? And didn't he know there was going to be so much hurt? And there's so much, all this mess. Wouldn't it have been more loving for him to just not create us? Right, you see how that's kind of at the root of this issue. That's kind of underlying this issue. So uh, last week, I, this is one of the things that I stated, and I kind of want to use this as kind of a covering over this because I believe it's biblical, but it sometimes leaves us unsatisfied that I believe that God is sovereign. I believe the Bible teaches clearly that God is sovereign over everything, that we are free, and I don't know how it works. Like there's, we want to pick, so many people want to pick these extremes of God's sovereignty and human free will and the Bible seems to hold them in a tension that we are, that we are uncomfortable with and frankly that we can't quite wrap our heads around. But I believe that they're, they're both true. We understand that God lives outside of time and space and yet created time and space so that's where some of that tension is. But here's what I do know, and here's where it's helpful for me in understanding this issue. To just, I, I can't answer a lot of those questions. Like, wouldn't it have been more loving not to create it? Or didn't God know it would go wrong? I, I, I mean, I, I don't know the answer to some of those questions. You, you probably can't figure them quite out either. But here's what I do know. This isn't how God created it in the first place. All you got to do is go to the very end of chapter 1 you got to go to the very end of chapter 1 of the Bible after God has created the heavens and the earth. This, this process that he goes through, and every, every day that he creates, every kind of segment that he creates, he says it's good. He creates the heavens and the earth, and it's good. It says he creates the, the earth, the land, and the waters, and the sky above, the firmament, and it says it's good and he creates the plants and he says it's good and he creates animals on the ground and fish in the sea and birds in the air and he says that it's good and finally at the pinnacle of his creation he creates humans male and female made in his image and this is what it says at the very end of chapter 1 Genesis 131 God saw all that he had made and it was what very good At the pinnacle of his creation, he made humanity, made in his image, and he said it was very good. Now, when is the last time that you have opened up your phone onto Facebook or Twitter or your favorite news feed or you have sat down and watched the news and saw that all that was happening in the world and thought to yourself, man, this is very good. It like never happens, right? You're like, yeah, boy, the world is so messed up. We are so messed up. People are so messed up. Things are just so messed up. But that's not the way God made it. God made it very good. At the end of creation, God said this is very good. It wasn't bad things. But in his created order, he gave human beings freedom because he wants a relationship with us and you know that that relationships require freedom and and here so and so here's the thing about uh relationships he said you you know you're free to eat from any tree in the garden you're free I want you to trust me to not eat from this tree we're going to talk about that in a minute 
but you're free because I want a relationship. I want you to trust me. That's what I want this relationship to look like. And here's what every person knows about relationships. And you, you, you figured this out in middle school in your first crush. Okay? Here, you figured this out in, in middle school in your first crush. That the potential that it could go right is worth the possibility that it could go wrong. Like when you, when you, in middle school, when you have that first crush and you want to ask somebody, back in my day, we asked someone if you wanted to go with me, even though we weren't going anywhere, but you're, if, we, if we did, you were going to go with me. I'm 12, but we're going together. Where? To third period. I, I mean, I, I don't know, but we're going together, right? Or whatever they do now. I like the, the middle school kids say, like, we're dating. I'm like, dating like you don't you don't go on dates so but whatever you know so we're, we're, we're that's what we do and you know that first feeling and the reason you can get over you know that you could get rejected it could not go right or you could like each other for three weeks and then get your heart broken you could think this is the one there is a possibility that it could go wrong and it gets more serious the older you get the more serious the relationships get right you know there's a possibility that you can get your heart broke because they are free. They don't have to love you back. But why do you take that step into the opportunity for love? Because there's potential that it could go right. And every, so it, God wanted a relationship with us. And the relationship that God chose with us is that of a heavenly father. And every parent knows this is true. Now, I'm not a heavenly father, but I'm a father. And you can ask any parent, why would you have children knowing that it could go wrong? Like, it, it could go wrong. In fact, if you'd have asked me when all my boys were born, like, do you, do you know that they'll mess up? And I would have said, well, like, I sort of know them. I don't know for a fact that they'll mess up, but I know they'll mess up. Because I know they have human nature in them. They're going to have choices. They probably won't bat a thousand. Right? They probably won't bat a thousand. And others could have said, you know, I wouldn't have children at all because it could go horribly wrong. That relationship could be a source of heartache and deep pain and hurt. It could really, yeah, it could. But also the relationship between a parent and child can bring so much joy and so much fulfillment and so much richness, right? The potential that it could go wrong is worth the possibility. The potential that it could go right is worth the possibility that it could go wrong. And here's what I'm convinced of that, that our Heavenly Father thought, that I'm certain that he created us knowing that if it did go wrong, he'd do anything to make it right. I think that's who God is, a father who wants a relationship and the potential that it could go right between you and me and him, oh, it was worth the possibility that it could go wrong. And if it did, He'd work to make it right. So let's talk about what God allows, this kind of why. Like, okay, well, I mean, that, but why does all this bad stuff? This why is bad things, why, this is the why bad things happen. God allows freedom, and not just freedom from us, but freedom from spiritual beings and earthly beings. So this is a two kind of part answer of what God allows. So here's what I want to tell you. The devil is real. The devil is real. Some suffering, some bad things happen because there is more than just good in this world. There is evil. God allowed his angels to have free will too. And one of them wanted to be like God. One of them wanted the throne and God cast him out of heaven. And now he and his band of angels turned demons fell with him and spend a chunk of their time on the earth. There's no way around the spiritual nature of this the Apostle Peter wrote it this way, okay? He said, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, is not just out there, is not just an idea, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Sometimes the devil is trying to devour. Sometimes the answer of bad things is the devil. Resist him. 
Standing firm in the faith because you know that the family of believers throughout the world is undergoing the same kind of suffering. Some people are suffering, Peter says, because the devil is real and prowling around looking for someone to devour. The enemy is at work. Sometimes the devil tempts us. Sometimes the devil deceives us and lies to us or tries to distract us. But I don't know another way to tell you that he's after us. He chose to turn away from God, chose to try and deceive humanity and make us believe that what God said would happen wouldn't really happen. And thousands of years, isn't that the same song, different verse? Don't you hear those same lies from the devil? Like, hey, 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 I know what they said would happen. That's not really going to happen. I know this book says that if you do this, that it won't be good for you, and this is God's way, but you don't need all those rules, and they're so restrictive. Isn't it the same lie? You know, what God said, it's not really going to happen. You do it your way. Trust yourself. And this is why sometimes it kind of gets me, and this goes to the, starts working on the second part. I mean, Christians, for this is real, the devil is real, the devil is active, the devil is working, but sometimes Christians use that excuse of like, the devil made me do it. He just gave you the idea, man. He didn't make you do anything. He didn't make me do anything, but we did it. And that leads to the second, what God allows, the second why, the second why is that the world is broken. The world is broken. Creation was very good, was perfect. Humans lived forever and were sustained fully by God. I mean, if you read Genesis 1 and 2, there's this unbelievable, beautiful relationship between God and humanity where there's nothing broken in it. They are, we are sustained by God. There's no death, but there are boundaries you're free to eat from any tree of the garden. And you can eat from this one, but I don't want you to eat from this one. If you eat from this one, you're not going to like the result, Adam. You're not going to like the result, Eve. And I want a relationship with you. And even though you don't understand this, I just want you to trust me. That's what relationships are. We trust each other. And I want you to trust me. If you, re if you eat from this tree, you're going to experience death of course, you know the story. They don't trust God. And it turns out not only would they end up dying, but the world would die with it. In Genesis 3, after the fall of creation of humanity, listen to what God says about how the world broke with sin. To the woman, he said, this boggles my mind, Okay. I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain, you shall deliver children. Hold up a second. Are you telling me that there was a time that pregnancy was easy? That's right. There was a time that getting pregnant was easy. There was a time that being pregnant was easy. There was a time that having a child was easy but sin broke the world this is what he says to Adam then to Adam he said cursed is the ground because of you with hard labor you shall eat from it all the days of your life both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you yet you shall eat of the plants of the field by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread hold up hold up a second are you telling me that there was a time that farming was easy? Have you ever known a farmer? Have you ever looked at a farmer and be like, man, you got, just, you got an easy street, man. You're a farmer. Now, what do we say about farmers now? Like, man, that's a hard life. That's early in the morning, early to bed, seven days a week, three, six. That's a hard work. Can you imagine that there was a time that the very ground that you stand on and that I stand on didn't feel cursed by natural disasters and unexplainable tragedies? Yeah. Sin broke the world. The devil is real. 
But the world is broken because we're deceived by him instead of trusting God. The world is broken. Sin knocked the world off its axis. And it's easy, if you're like me, you just want to kick Adam and Eve in the teeth, don't you? But I've disobeyed God too. I want to do that to Adam and Eve, but I, I don't know about you, but I feel like I keep breaking this broken world. Now, hear me out. This is so important on this issue. That does not mean that individual tragedies are a response because of individual sin. You don't get cancer because you sinned. You don't get laid off from work for some unrelated sin. Tornadoes don't happen because of some neighborhood's sin. The brokenness and chaos of the world is a result of our collective sin. See, here's sort of part of the answer to why the bad things happen to good people. We don't like this. There are no good people. We're all sinners. And we're all breaking this broken world more and more. We all cause the chaos. This world is out of order, out of relationship with its creator who made us to be very good. So this question about like why do bad things happen to good people and why is there so much suffering? I mean, we've been asking this question for centuries of like, I mean, and I just want to go like, have you made it past chapter 3? This is a book full of suffering. There's a book in here called Job, who's, who's a man whose entire life was basically suffering, an entire book dedicated to a man who God called the most faithful man on planet Earth, and he suffered. The Apostle Paul, who was the most important Christian author to ever live, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, who God gave the mission to spread the gospel to the Gentile world, talked about how he wrestled with a thorn in his flesh his whole life. I mean, that's, that's kind of the story of the book. I mean, I, sometimes I just wonder, where did we pick up the idea that following Jesus would mean lollipops and butterflies and unicorns. I, I don't know where we get, where do we pick up the good, the, the idea that being a good Christian would mean that we would have a hedge of protection around us? I mean, uh, listen, in chapter four, a bad guy kills a good guy. In chapter four, And it's all downhill from there. God's people are enslaved for 400 years. Prophets are outcasts from society. John the Baptist, who Jesus called the greatest man who ever lived, the greatest man ever born of a woman, is beheaded. That's his reward for being the greatest man who ever lived. The apostles are martyred and the Christ is crucified. Where in the world? Here's the question that we should be asking. Why wouldn't we expect suffering? If that is the story from chapter 4 to Revelation 22, why would we expect it to be any different? And this is, in fact, what Jesus said. In fact, Jesus made this promise. Do you know that? In this world, you will have trouble. Well, I mean, that concludes our message today, right? Why do bad things happen to good people? Because Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. What made us think otherwise? What made us think it would be different? Jesus said, in this world, you're going to have tribulation. You're going to have anguish. You're going to have hurt, affliction, persecution. You're going to have trouble. But then Jesus says something, oh, man, that begins to speak into God's response to the trouble. But take heart. I have overcome the world. Jesus is how God responded. The answer to the brokenness, the answer to Eden was a garden in Gethsemane where Jesus got on his knees and said, not my will but thine, but I take it. Jesus was how God responded. 
In response to our sin, he made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we could be the righteousness of God. So the bad people could be called good people in the sight of God. When humans brought death into the world, God said, I'll become human to bring eternal life into the world through the death of my son, the God made flesh. Jesus is how God responded. And so, here's what's so crazy. God flipped this question upside down. When we say, why do bad things happen to good people? I just go like, Christians believe the, like, the exact opposite of that. Check this out. We believe the worst possible thing happened to the best possible person, so the best possible thing could happen for all of us bad people. We believe the worst possible thing, a gruesome, bloody, punishing cruci crucifixion, happened to the best possible person, the God-made flesh, the one perfect human, fully God and fully human, so that the best possible thing, eternal life, could happen to all of us bad people who have sinned and broke the world. Friends, that's good news. Like, so when people come to us and go, like, I'm just not sure about Christianity and God and religion and faith because I just can't reconcile how bad things, you know, keep happening to good people, we should say, whoa, whoa, whoa. Can I tell you what happened when the worst possible thing happened to the best possible person? Hey, it's good news because it means the best possible thing for you. I mean, this should come in our life. We have eternal life because the worst possible thing, because a bad thing happened to the best possible. You have heaven running through your veins because of a bad thing happening to the best man. And then when they say like, well, see, then there's this like one last part, right? Well, does that mean I'm not going to die? What about death? And we can say, oh, let me tell you about death. It's going to get you one day. It's going to get me. But we believe that Jesus defeated death. And the promise we hold on to is that no matter how death defeats us in this world, our hope is in the next and nothing can take that away. So I am able to live in this world with a kind of hope that seems like it's from another world. Because it is. Paul put an exclamation point on this. And I believe it puts an exclamation point for us. And this was the passage that I read over the funeral of that dad. I consider our present sufferings, and you've got some, are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us, will be is future tense. It will be revealed, but you don't have it right now. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. Right now we are waiting. We are in the waiting time for something that to be is going to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration we see the suffering, we see the hurt, we look at the news, we, we talk with friends in tear-stained conversations, and it's frustrating, not by its own choice, but by the will of one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay. Right now, it feels like the world is rotting sometimes. And will be brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. And listen to this. We know that the whole creation, the whole world, has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up until the present time. The whole world aches. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit. Meaning that even those of us who have Christ living in us, who have the Holy Spirit in us, that doesn't fix everything. You don't get saved and it fixes everything, Paul says. We groan inwardly because we're waiting too as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. We are still under this bondage of decay. We can't escape death on this world. But Paul says we are waiting for a redemption that even our bodies will be redeemed, that I will wake up one day and my back won't hurt. I will wake up one day and my knee won't hurt. 
I will wake up one day and I'll feel 17 again. I'll wake up one day and it'll, it'll all be right. For in this hope, we were saved. And then we all say, well, I want it now. Why can't we just fix it now? And Paul says, but hope that is seen? Well, that's no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do know, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit intercedes for us through wordless groans. Can you just believe that, man, that the Holy Spirit is praying for you even when it's frustrating, even when you're suffering? And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance to the will of God. If you are suffering, if you feel like you're going through a bad thing, I want you to know something right now. The Holy Spirit is standing before the presence of Almighty God and is praying for you. He's praying for you. Say, come on, Lord, give them faith to wait it out, to wait it out for the hope and help them to trust this. That in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Mm. God is working for the good. It doesn't mean that the suffering is good. And it doesn't mean that you'll ever look back and go, that season was good. It means that you can look forward and go, I believe that no matter what, he is working for good. And he proved that when Jesus took on the suffering and death caused by humanity to give us the eternal life he'd always wanted for humanity. You see, the worst possible thing happened to the best possible person, so the best possible thing could happen for all of us bad people. So that one day there'll be no more suffering, no more tears, no more hurt, no more heartache. There'll just be people standing before God, redeemed and righteous in his presence. And so you wanna tell me why I'm so crazy about inviting you to follow Jesus is because it is the only hope for this broken, messed up, chaotic world. That one day the suffering, one day the hurt, one day the heartache is going to end. And I want you to be standing with the only people that will be standing before God, righteous, redeemed, and forgiven. Those that said yes to Jesus. Is this isn't a show for us. We're not playing church. We're just trying to do religion. I want you to have the only thing, the only only answer for when bad things happen to good people to realize that I'm not a good people I'm a bad people I'm a sinner but there is a Savior who has redeemed me and made me righteous before God and one day that will be my answer it's what I want for you it's the only hope and I'm convinced of this if the world could see right now in this world all those people who have already said yes to Jesus, if the world could see this in us, could see heaven coursing through our veins and God's Spirit shining through our eyes, I believe that this world would take notice. Because I want to tell you something. Bad things are going to keep happening to people in this world. And the only hope is that they see in us a Savior who has overcome this world. Heavenly Father, thank you for the answer of Jesus. Thank you that you love us. And even when it went terribly wrong, you sent your Son to make it right. Lord, help us to take a step of faith. I want everybody in this room to have the only answer to that question in their heart. Jesus and I want every person in this room to shine for all of Birmingham and every person watching at home to shine for wherever community that surrounds them so that they would see in us a Savior who has overcome this crazy chaotic messed up world in Jesus name